the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter sixteen a cold rain began to fall and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist the public houses were just closing and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors from some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter in others drunkards brawled and screamed lying back in the hansom with his hat pulled over his forehead dorian gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city and now and then he repeated to himself the words that lord henry had said to him on the first day they had met to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul yes that was the secret he had often tried it and would try it again now there were opium dens where one could buy oblivion dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new the moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull from time to time a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hid it the gas lamps grew fewer and the streets more narrow and gloomy once the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile a steam rose from the horse as it splashed up the puddles the side windows of the hansom were clogged with a grey flannel mist to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul how the words rang in his ears his soul certainly was sick to death was it true that the senses could cure it innocent blood had been spilled what could atone for that ah oh, for that there was no atonement but though forgiveness was impossible forgetfulness was possible still and he was determined to forget to stamp the thing out to crush it as one would crush the adder that had stung one indeed what right had basil to have spoken to him as he had done who had made him a judge over others he had said things that were dreadful horrible not to be endured on and on plodded the handsome going slower it seemed to him at each step he thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster the hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him his throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together he struck at the horse madly with his stick the driver laughed and whipped up he laughed in answer and the man was silent the way seemed interminable and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider the monotony became unbearable and as the mist thickened he felt afraid then they passed by lonely brickfields the fog was lighter here and he could see the strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire a dog barked as they went by and far away in the darkness some wandering seagulls screamed the horse stumbled in a rut then swerved aside and broke into a gallop after some time they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets most of the windows were dark but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamplit blind he watched them curiously they moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things he hated them a dull rage was in his heart as they turned a corner a woman yelled something at them from an open door and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards 
the driver beat at them with his whip it is said that passion makes one think in a circle certainly with hideous iteration the bitten lips of dorian gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense till he had found in them the full expression as it were of his mood and justified by intellectual approval passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper from cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought and the wild desire to live most terrible of all man's appetites quickened into force each trembling nerve and fibre ugliness that had once been hateful to him because it made things real became dear to him now for that very reason ugliness was the one reality the coarse brawl the loathsome den the crude violence of disordered life the very vileness of thief and outcast were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art the dreamy shadows of song they were what he needed for forgetfulness in three days he would be free suddenly the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane over the low roofs and the jagged chimney-stacks of the houses rose the black masts of ships wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards somewhere about here sir ain't it he asked huskily through the trap dorian started and peered round this will do he answered and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him he walked quickly in the direction of the quay here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman the light shook and splintered in the puddles a red glare came from an outward bound steamer that was coaling the slimy pavement looked like a wet mackintosh he hurried on towards the left glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed in about seven or eight minutes he reached a small shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories in one of the top windows stood a lamp he stopped and gave a peculiar knock after a little time he heard steps in the passage and the chain being unhooked the door opened quietly and he went in without saying a word to the squat misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed at the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind which had followed him in from the street he dragged it aside and entered a long low room which looked as if it had once been a third-rate dancing saloon shrill flaring gas-jets dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them were ranged round the walls greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them making quivering discs of light the floor was covered with ochre-coloured sawdust trampled here and there into mud and stained with dark rings of spilled liquor some malays were crouching by a little charcoal stove playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered in one corner with his head buried in his arms a sailor sprawled over a table and by the tawdrily painted bar that ran across one complete side stood two haggard women mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust he thinks he's got red ants on him laughed one of them as dorian passed by the man looked at her in terror and began to whimper at the end of the room there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber as dorian hurried up its three rickety steps the heavy odour of opium met him. 
he heaved a deep breath and his nostrils quivered with pleasure when he entered a young man with smooth yellow hair who was bending over a lamp lighting a long thin pipe looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner you hear adrian muttered dorian where else should i be he answered listlessly none of the chaps will speak to me now i thought you had left england darlington is not going to do anything my brother paid the bill at last george doesn't speak to me either i don't care he added with a sigh as long as one has this stuff one doesn't want friends i think i have had too many friends dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses the twisted limbs the gaping mouths the staring lustreless eyes fascinated him he knew in what strange heavens they were suffering and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy they were better off than he was he was prisoned in thought memory like a horrible malady was eating his soul away from time to time he seemed to see the eyes of basil hallward looking at him yet he felt he could not stay the presence of adrian singleton troubled him he wanted to be where no one would know who he was he wanted to escape from himself i am going to the other place he said after a pause on the wharf yes that mad cat is sure to be there they won't have her in this place now dorian shrugged his shoulders i am sick of women who love one women who hate one are much more interesting besides the stuff is better much the same i like it better come and have something to drink i must have something i don't want anything murmured the young man never mind adrian singleton rose up wearily and followed dorian to the bar a half-caste in a ragged turban and a shabby ulster grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them the women sidled up and began to chatter dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to adrian singleton a crooked smile like a malay crease writhed across the face of one of the women we are very proud to-night she sneered for god's sake don't talk to me cried dorian stamping his foot on the ground what do you want money here it is don't ever talk to me again two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes then flickered out and left them dull and glazed she tossed her head and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers her companion watched her enviously it's no use sighed adrian singleton i don't care to go back what does it matter i'm quite happy here you'll write to me if you want anything won't you said dorian after a pause perhaps good night then good night answered the young man passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief dorian walked to the door with a look of pain in his face as he drew the curtain aside a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the woman who had taken his money <laughs> there goes the devil's bargain she hiccoughed in a hoarse voice curse you he answered don't call me that she snapped her fingers prince charming is what you like to be called ain't it she yelled after him the drowsy sailor leaped to his feet as she spoke and looked wildly round the sound of the shutting of the hall door fell on his ear he rushed out as if in pursuit dorian gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain his meeting with adrian singleton had strangely moved him and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door as basil hallward had said to him with such infamy of insult he bit his lip 
and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad yet after all what did it matter to him one's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it the only pity was one had to pay so often for a single fault one had to pay over and over again indeed in her dealings with man destiny never closed her accounts there are moments psychologists tell us when the passion for sin or for what the world calls sin so dominates a nature that every fibre of the body as every cell of the brain seems to be instinct with fearful impulses men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will they move to their terrible end as automatons move choice is taken from them and conscience is either killed or if it lives at all lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charm for all sins as theologians weary not of reminding us are sins of disobedience when that high spirit that morning star of evil fell from heaven it was as a rebel that he fell callous concentrated on evil with stained mind and soul hungry for rebellion dorian gray hastened on quickening his step as he went but as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going he felt himself suddenly seized from behind and before he had time to defend himself he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand round his throat he struggled madly for life and by a terrible effort wrenched the tightening fingers away in a second he heard the click of a revolver and saw the gleam of a polished barrel pointing straight at his head and the dusky form of a short thick-set man facing him what do you want he gasped keep quiet said the man if you stir i shoot you you're mad what have i done to you you wrecked the life of sybil bain was the answer and sybil bain was my sister she killed herself i know it her death is at your door i swore i would kill you in return for years i have sought you i had no clue no trace the two people who could have described you were dead i knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you i heard it tonight by chance make your peace with god for tonight you are going to die dorian gray grew sick with fear i never knew her he stammered i have never heard of her you are mad you had better confess your sin for as sure as i am james vane you are going to die there was a horrible moment dorian did not know what to say or do down on your knees growled the man i give you one minute to make your peace no more i go on board tonight for india and i must do my job first one minute that's all dorian's arms fell to his side paralyzed with terror he did not know what to do suddenly a wild hope flashed across his brain stop he cried how long ago is it since your sister died quick tell me eighteen years said the man why do you ask what do years matter eighteen years laughed dorian gray with a touch of triumph in his voice eighteen years set me under the lamp and look at my face james vane hesitated for a moment not understanding what was meant then he seized dorian gray and dragged him from the archway dim and wavering as was the wind-blown light yet it served to show him the hideous error as it seemed into which he had fallen for the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood all the unstained purity of youth he seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers 
hardly older if older indeed at all than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago it was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life he loosened his hold and reeled back my god my god he cried and i would have murdered you dorian gray drew a long breath you have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime my man he said looking at him sternly let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands forgive me sir muttered james vane i was deceived a chance word i heard in that damned den set me on the wrong track you had better go home and put that pistol away or you may get into trouble said dorian turning on his heel and going slowly down the street james vane stood on the pavement in horror he was trembling from head to foot after a little while a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps he felt a hand laid on his arm and looked round with a start it was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar why didn't you kill him she hissed out putting a haggard face quite close to his i knew you were following him when you rushed out from daly's you fool you should have killed him he has lots of money and he's as bad as bad he is not the man i am looking for he answered and i want no man's money i want a man's life the man whose life i want must be nearly forty now this one is little more than a boy. Thank God I have not got his blood upon my hands. The woman gave a bitter laugh. Little more than a boy? She sneered. Why, man, it's not an eighteen years since Prince Charming made me what I am. You lie, cried James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God, I am telling the truth, she cried. Before God? Strike me dumb if it ain't so. He is the worst one that comes here. They say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on eighteen years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she added with a sickly leer. You swear this? I swear it, came in hoarse echo from her flat mouth. But don't give me away to him, she whined. I am afraid of him let me have some money for my night's lodging he broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street but dorian gray had disappeared when he looked back the woman had vanished also end of chapter sixteen the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter seventeen a week later dorian gray was sitting in the conservatory at selby royal talking to the pretty duchess of monmouth who with her husband a jaded-looking man of sixty was amongst his guests it was tea-time and the mellow light of the huge lace-covered lamp that stood on the table lit up the delicate china and hammered silver of the service at which the duchess was presiding her white hands were moving daintily among the cups and her full red lips were smiling at something that dorian had whispered to her lord henry was lying back in a silk-draped wicker chair looking at them on a peach-coloured divan sat lady narborough pretending to listen to the duke's description of the last brazilian beetle that he had added to his collection three young men in elaborate smoking suits were handing tea-cakes to some of the women the house-party consisted of twelve people and there were more expected to arrive on the next day what are you two talking about said lord henry strolling over to the table and putting his cup down i hope dorian has told you about my plan for rechristening everything gladys it is a delightful idea but i don't want to be rechristened harry 
rejoined the duchess looking up at him with her wonderful eyes i am quite satisfied with my own name and i am sure mr gray should be satisfied with his my dear gladys i would not alter either name for the world they are both perfect i was thinking chiefly of flowers yesterday i cut an orchid for my buttonhole it was a marvellous spotted thing as effective as the seven deadly sins in a thoughtless moment i asked one of the gardeners what it was called he told me it was a fine specimen of robinsoniana or something dreadful of that kind it is a sad truth but we have lost the faculty of giving lovely names to things names are everything i never quarrel with actions my one quarrel is with words that is the reason i hate vulgar realism in literature the man who could call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one it is the only thing he is fit for then what should we call you harry she asked his name is prince paradox said dorian i recognize him in a flash exclaimed the duchess <laughs> i won't hear of it laughed lord henry sinking into a chair from a label there is no escape i refuse the title royalties may not abdicate fell as a warning from pretty lips you wish me to defend my throne then yes i give the truths of to-morrow i prefer the mistakes of to-day she answered you disarm me gladys he cried catching the wilfulness of her mood of your shield harry not of your spear i never tilt against beauty he said with a wave of his hand that is your error harry believe me you value beauty far too much how can you say that i admit that i think that it is better to be beautiful than to be good but on the other hand no one is more ready than i am to acknowledge that it is better to be good than to be ugly ugliness is one of the seven deadly sins then cried the duchess what becomes of your simile about your orchid ugliness is one of the seven deadly virtues gladys you as a good tory must not underrate them beer the bible and the seven deadly virtues have made our england what she is you don't like your country then she asked i live in it that you may censor it the better would you have me take the verdict of europe on it he inquired what do they say of us that tartuffe has emigrated to england and opened a shop is that yours harry i give it to you i could not use it it is too true you need not be afraid our countrymen never recognize a description they are practical they are more cunning than practical when they make up their ledger they balance stupidity by wealth and vice by hypocrisy still we have done great things great things have been thrust on us gladys we have carried their burden only as far as the stock exchange she shook her head i believe in the race she cried it represents the survival of the pushing it has development decay fascinates me more what of art she asked it is a malady love an illusion religion the fashionable substitute for belief you are a skeptic never skepticism is the beginning of faith what are you to define is to limit give me a clue threads snap you would lose your way in the labyrinth you bewilder me let us talk of someone else our host is a delightful topic years ago he was christened prince charming ah don't remind me of that cried dorian gray our host is rather horrid this evening answered the duchess colouring i believe he thinks that monmouth married me on purely scientific principles as the best specimen he could find of a modern butterfly well i hope that he won't stick pins into you duchess laughed dorian oh my maid does that already mr gray when she is annoyed with me and what did she get annoyed with you about duchess for the most trivial things mr gray i assure you usually because i come in at ten minutes to nine and tell her that i must be dressed by half-past eight how unreasonable of her you should give her a warning i daren't mr gray 
why she invents hats for me you remember the one i wore at lady hillstone's garden party you don't but it is nice of you to pretend that you do well she made it out of nothing all good hats are made out of nothing like all good reputations gladys interrupted lord henry every effect that one produces gives one an enemy to be popular one must be a mediocrity not with women said the duchess shaking her head and women rule the world i assure you we can't bear mediocrities we women as some one says love with our ears just as you men love with your eyes if you ever love at all it seems to me we never do anything else murmured dorian ah oh, then you never really love mr gray answered the duchess with mock sadness my dear gladys cried lord henry how can you say that romance lives by repetition and repetition converts an appetite into an art besides each time that one loves is the only time one has ever loved difference of object does not alter a singleness of passion it merely intensifies it we can have in life but one great experience at best and the secret of life is to reproduce that experience as often as possible even when one has been wounded by it harry asked the duchess after a pause especially when one has been wounded by it answered lord henry the duchess turned and looked at dorian gray with a curious expression in her eyes what do you say to that mr gray she inquired dorian hesitated for a moment then he threw his head back and laughed <laughs> i always agree with harry duchess even when he is wrong harry is never wrong duchess and does his philosophy make you happy i have never searched for happiness who wants happiness i have searched for pleasure and found it mr gray often too often the duchess sighed <sighs> i am searching for peace she said and if i don't go and dress i shall have none this evening let me get you some orchids duchess cried dorian starting to his feet and walking down the conservatory you are flirting disgracefully with him said lord henry to his cousin you had better take care he is very fascinating if he were not there would be no battle greek meets greek then i am on the sides of the trojans they fought for a woman they were defeated there are worse things than capture she answered you gallop with a loose rein pace gives life was the repost i shall write it in my diary to-night what that a burnt child loves the fire i am not even singed my wings are untouched you use them for everything except flight courage has passed from men to women it is a new experience for us you have a rival who he laughed <laughs> lady narborough he whispered she perfectly adores him you fill me with apprehension the appeal to antiquity is fatal to us who are romanticists romanticists you have all the methods of science men have educated us but not explained you describe us as a sex was her challenge sphinxes without secrets she looked at him smiling how long mr gray is she said let us go and help him i have not yet told him the colour of my frock ah you must suit your frock to his flowers gladys that would be a premature surrender romantic art begins with its climax i must keep an opportunity for retreat in the parthian manner they found safety in the desert i could not do that women are not always allowed a choice he answered but hardly had he finished the sentence before from the far end of the conservatory came a stifled groan followed by the dull sound of a heavy fall everybody started up the duchess stood motionless in horror and with fear in his eyes lord henry rushed through the flapping palms to find dorian gray lying face downwards on the tiled floor in a death-like swoon 
he was carried at once into the blue drawing-room and laid upon one of the sofas after a short time he came to himself and looked round with a dazed expression what has happened he asked oh i remember am i safe here harry he began to tremble my dear dorian answered lord henry you merely fainted that was all you must have overtired yourself you had better not come down to dinner i will take your place no i will come down he said struggling to his feet i would rather come down i must not be alone he went to his room and dressed there was a wild recklessness of gaiety in his manner as he sat at table but now and then a thrill of terror ran through him when he remembered that pressed against the window of the conservatory like a white handkerchief he had seen the face of james vane watching him end of chapter 17 the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter 18 the next day he did not leave the house and indeed spent most of the time in his own room sick with a wild terror of dying and yet indifferent to life itself the consciousness of being hunted snared tracked down had begun to dominate him if the tapestry did but tremble in the wind he shook the dead leaves that were blown against the leaded panes seemed to him like his own wasted resolutions and wild regrets when he closed his eyes he saw again the sailor's face peering through the mist-stained glass and horror seemed once more to lay its hand upon his heart but perhaps it had been only his fancy that had called vengeance out of the night and set the hideous shapes of punishment before him actual life was chaos but there was something terribly logical in the imagination it was the imagination that set remorse to dog the feet of sin it was the imagination that made each crime bear its misshapen brood in the common world of fact the wicked were not punished nor the good rewarded success was given to the strong failure thrust upon the weak that was all besides had any stranger been prowling round the house he would have been seen by the servants or the keepers had any footmarks been found on the flower beds the gardeners would have reported it yes it had been merely fancy sibyl vane's brother had not come back to kill him he had sailed away in his ship to founder in some winter sea from him at any rate he was safe why the man did not know who he was could not know who he was the mask of youth had saved him and yet if it had been merely an illusion how terrible it was to think that conscience could raise such fearful phantoms and give them visible form and make them move before one what sort of life would be his if day and night shadows of his crime were to peer at him from silent corners to mock him from secret places to whisper in his ear as he sat at the feast to wake him with icy fingers as he lay asleep as the thought crept through his brain he grew pale with terror and the air seemed to him to have become suddenly colder oh in what a wild hour of madness he had killed his friend how ghastly the mere memory of the scene he saw it all again each hideous detail came back to him with added horror 
out of the black cave of time terrible and swathed in scarlet rose the image of his sin when lord henry came in at six o'clock he found him crying as one whose heart will break it was not till the third day that he ventured to go out there was something in the clear pine-scented air of that winter morning that seemed to bring him back his joyousness and his ardour for life but it was not merely the physical conditions of environment that had caused the change his own nature had revolted against the excess of anguish that had sought to maim and mar the perfection of its calm with subtle and finely wrought temperaments it is always so their strong passions must either bruise or bend they either slay the man or themselves die shallow sorrows and shallow loves live on the loves and sorrows that are great are destroyed by their own plenitude besides he had convinced himself that he had been the victim of a terror-stricken imagination and looked back now on his fears with something of pity and not a little of contempt after breakfast he walked with the duchess for an hour in the garden and then drove across the park to join the shooting party the crisp frost lay like salt upon the grass the sky was an inverted cup of blue metal a thin film of ice bordered the flat reed-grown lake at the corner of the pine wood he caught sight of sir geoffrey clouston the duchess's brother jerking two spent cartridges out of his gun he jumped from the cart and having told the groom to take the mare home made his way towards his guest through the withered bracken and rough undergrowth have you had good sport geoffrey he asked not very good dorian i think most of the birds have gone to the open i dare say it will be better after lunch when we get to new ground dorian strolled along by his side the keen aromatic air the brown and red lights that glimmered in the wood the hoarse cries of the beaters ringing out from time to time and the sharp snaps of the guns that followed fascinated him and filled him with a sense of delightful freedom he was dominated by the carelessness of happiness by the high indifference of joy suddenly from a lumpy tussock of old grass some twenty yards in front of them with black-tipped ears erect and long hinder limbs throwing it forward started a hare it bolted for a thicket of alders sir geoffrey put his gun to his shoulder but there was something in the animal's grace of movement that strangely charmed dorian gray and he cried out at once don't shoot it geoffrey let it live what nonsense dorian laughed his companion and as the hare bounded into the thicket he fired there were two cries heard the cry of a hare in pain which is dreadful the cry of a man in agony which is worse good heavens i have hit a beater exclaimed sir geoffrey what an ass the man was to get in front of the guns stop shooting there he called out at the top of his voice a man is hurt the head keeper came running up with a stick in his hand where sir where is he he shouted at the same time the firing ceased along the line here answered sir geoffrey angrily hurrying towards the thicket why on earth don't you keep your men back spoiled my shooting for the day dorian watched them as they plunged into the alder clump brushing the lithe swinging branches aside in a few moments they emerged dragging a body after them into the sunlight he turned away in horror it seemed to him that misfortune followed wherever he went he heard sir geoffrey ask if the man was really dead 
and the affirmative answer of the keeper the wood seemed to him to have become suddenly alive with faces there was the trampling of myriad feet and the low buzz of voices a great copper-breasted pheasant came beating through the boughs overhead after a few moments that were to him in his perturbed state like endless hours of pain he felt a hand laid on his shoulder he started and looked round dorian said lord henry i'd better tell them that the shooting is stopped for to-day it would not look well to go on i wish it was stopped for ever harry he answered bitterly the whole thing is hideous and cruel is the man he could not finish the sentence i'm afraid so rejoined lord henry he got the whole charge of shot in his chest he must have died almost instantaneously come let us go home they walked side by side in the direction of the avenue for nearly fifty yards without speaking then dorian looked at lord henry and said with a heavy sigh it is a bad omen harry a very bad omen what is asked lord henry oh this accident i suppose my dear fellow it can't be helped it was the man's own fault why did he get in front of the guns besides it is nothing to us it is rather awkward for geoffrey of course it does not do to pepper beaters it makes people think that one is a wild shot and geoffrey is not he shoots very straight but there is no use talking about the matter dorian shook his head it is a bad omen harry i feel as if something horrible were going to happen to some of us to myself perhaps he added passing his hand over his eyes with a gesture of pain the elder man laughed <laughs> the only horrible thing in the world is ennui dorian that is the one sin for which there is no forgiveness but we are not likely to suffer from it unless these fellows keep chattering about this thing at dinner i must tell them that the subject is to be tabooed as for omens there is no such thing as an omen destiny does not send us heralds she is too wise or too cruel for that besides what on earth could happen to you dorian you have everything in the world that a man can want there is no one who would not be delighted to change places with you there is no one with whom i would not change places harry don't laugh like that i am telling you the truth the wretched peasant who has just died is better off than i am i have no terror of death it is the coming of death that terrifies me its monstrous wings seem to wheel in the leaden air around me good heavens don't you see a man moving behind the trees there watching me waiting for me lord henry looked in the direction in which the trembling gloved hand was pointing yes he said smiling i see the gardener waiting for you i suppose he wants to ask you what flowers you wish to have on the table to-night how absurdly nervous you are my dear fellow you must come and see my doctor when we get back to town dorian heaved a sigh of relief as he saw the gardener approaching the man touched his hat glanced for a moment at lord henry in a hesitating manner and then produced a letter which he handed to his master her grace told me to wait for an answer he murmured dorian put the letter into his pocket tell her grace that i am coming in he said coldly the man turned round and went rapidly in the direction of the house how fond women are of doing dangerous things laughed lord henry it is one of the qualities in them that i admire most a woman will flirt with anybody in the world as long as other people are looking on how fond you are of saying dangerous things harry in the present instance you are quite astray i like the duchess very much but i don't love her and the duchess loves you very much but she likes you less so you are excellently matched you are talking scandal harry and there is never any basis for scandal the basis of every scandal is an immoral certainty said lord henry lighting a cigarette you would sacrifice anybody harry for the sake of an epigram 
the world goes to the altar of its own accord was the answer i wish i could love cried dorian gray with a deep note of pathos in his voice but i seem to have lost the passion and forgotten the desire i am too much concentrated on myself my own personality has become a burden to me i want to escape to go away to forget it was silly of me to come down here at all i think i shall send a wire to harvey to have the yacht got ready on a yacht one is safe safe from what dorian you are in some trouble why not tell me what it is you know i would help you i can't tell you harry he answered sadly and i dare say it is only a fancy of mine this unfortunate accident has upset me i have a horrible presentiment that something of the kind may happen to me what nonsense i hope it is but i can't help feeling it ah here is the duchess looking like artemis in a tailor-made gown you see we have come back duchess i have heard all about it mr gray she answered poor geoffrey is terribly upset and it seems that you asked him not to shoot the hare how curious yes it was very curious i don't know what made me say it some whim i suppose it looked the loveliest of little live things but i am sorry they told you about the man it is a hideous subject it is an annoying subject broke in lord henry it has no psychological value at all now if geoffrey had done the thing on purpose how interesting he would be i should like to know some one who had committed a real murder how horrid of you harry cried the duchess isn't it mr gray harry mr gray is ill again he's going to faint it is nothing duchess he murmured my nerves are dreadfully out of order that is all i'm afraid i walked too far this morning i didn't hear what harry said was it very bad you must tell me some other time i think i must go and lie down you will excuse me won't you they had reached the great flight of steps that led from the conservatory on to the terrace as the glass door closed behind dorian lord henry turned and looked at the duchess with his slumberous eyes are you very much in love with him he asked she did not answer for some time but stood gazing at the landscape i wish i knew she said at last he shook his head knowledge would be fatal it is the uncertainty that charms one a mist makes things wonderful one may lose one's way always end at the same point my dear gladys what is that disillusion it was my debut in life she sighed it came to you crowned i am tired of strawberry leaves they become you only in public you would miss them said lord henry i will not part with a petal monmouth has ears old age is dull of hearing has he never been jealous i wish he had been he glanced about as if in search of something what are you looking for she inquired the button from your foil he answered you have dropped it she laughed i have still the mask it makes your eyes lovelier was his reply she laughed again her teeth showed like white seeds in a scarlet fruit upstairs in his own room dorian gray was lying on a sofa with terror in every tingling fibre of his body life had suddenly become too hideous a burden for him to bear the dreadful death of the unlucky beater shot in the thicket like a wild animal had seemed to him to prefigure death for himself also he had nearly swooned at what lord henry had said in a chance mood of cynical jesting at five o'clock he rang his bell for his servant and gave him orders to pack his things for the night express to town and to have the brougham at the door by eight thirty he was determined not to sleep another night at selby royal it was an ill-omened place death walked there in the sunlight 
the grass of the forest had been spotted with blood then he wrote a note to lord henry telling him that he was going up to town to consult his doctor and asking him to entertain his guests in his absence as he was putting it into the envelope a knock came to the door and his valet informed him that the head keeper wished to see him he frowned and bit his lip send him in he muttered after some moments hesitation as soon as the man entered dorian pulled his cheque-book out of a drawer and spread it out before him i suppose you have come about that unfortunate accident of this morning thornton he said taking up a pen yes sir answered the gamekeeper was the poor fellow married had he any people dependent on him asked dorian looking bored if so i should not like them to be left in want and will send them any sum of money you may think necessary we don't know who he is sir that is what i took the liberty of coming to you about don't know who he is said dorian listlessly what do you mean wasn't he one of your men no sir never saw him before seems like a sailor sir the pen dropped from dorian gray's hand and he felt as if his heart had suddenly stopped beating a sailor he cried out did you see a sailor yes sir he looks as if he had been a sort of sailor tattooed on both arms and that kind of thing was there anything found on him said dorian leaning forward and looking at the man with startled eyes anything that would tell his name some money sir not much and a sick shooter there was no name of any kind a decent-looking man sir but rough-like a sort of sailor we think dorian started to his feet a terrible hope fluttered past him he clutched at it madly where is the body he exclaimed quick i must see it at once it is in an empty stable in the home farm sir the folk don't like to have that sort of thing in their houses they say a corpse brings bad luck the home farm go there at once and meet me tell one of the grooms to bring my horse around no never mind i'll go to the stables myself it will save time in less than a quarter of an hour dorian gray was galloping down the long avenue as hard as he could go the trees seemed to sweep past him in spectral procession and wild shadows to fling themselves across his path once the mare swerved at a white gate-post and nearly threw him he lashed her across her neck with his crop she cleft the dusky air like an arrow the stones flew from her hoofs at last he reached the home farm two men were loitering in the yard he leaped from the saddle and threw the reins to one of them in the farthest stable a light was glimmering something seemed to tell him that the body was there and he hurried to the door and put his hand upon the latch there he paused for a moment feeling that he was on the brink of a discovery that would either make or mar his life then he thrust the door open and entered on a heap of sacking in the far corner was lying the dead body of a man dressed in a coarse shirt and a pair of blue trousers a spotted handkerchief had been placed over the face a coarse candle stuck in a bottle sputtered beside it dorian gray shuddered he felt that his could not be the hand to take the handkerchief away and called out to one of the farm servants to come to him take that thing off the face i wish to see it he said clutching at the doorpost for support when the farm servant had done so he stepped forward a cry of joy broke from his lips the man who had been shot in the thicket was james vane he stood there for some minutes looking at the dead body as he rode home his eyes were full of tears for he knew he was safe End of chapter
End of chapter 18 The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter 19 There is no use your telling me that you are going to be good, cried Lord Henry, dipping his white fingers into a red copper bowl filled with rose water. You are quite perfect. Pray don't change. Dorian Gray shook his head. No, Harry, I have done too many dreadful things in my life. I am not going to do any more. I began my good actions yesterday. Where were you yesterday? In the country, Harry. I was staying at a little inn by myself. My dear boy, said Lord Henry, smiling. Anybody can be good in the country. There are no temptations there. That is the reason why people who live out of town are so absolutely uncivilized. Civilization is not by any means an easy thing to attain to. There are only two ways by which man can reach it. One is by being cultured, the other by being corrupt. Country people have no opportunity of being either, so they stagnate. Culture and corruption, echoed Dorian. I have known something of both. It seems terrible to me now that they should ever be found together. For I have a new ideal, Harry. I am going to alter. I think I have altered. You have not yet told me what your good action was. Or did you say you had done more than one? Asked his companion, as he spilled into his plate a little crimson pyramid of seeded strawberries, and threw a perforated shell-shaped spoon, snowed white sugar upon them. I can tell you, Harry, it is not a story I could tell to anyone else. I spared somebody. It sounds vain, but you understand what I mean. She was quite beautiful, and wonderfully like Sybil Vane. I think it was that which first attracted me to her. You remember Sybil, don't you? How long ago that seems. Well, Hetty was not one of our own class, of course. She was simply a girl in a village. But I really loved her. I am quite sure that I loved her. All during this wonderful May that we have been having, I used to run down and see her two or three times a week. Yesterday she met me in a little orchard. The apple blossoms kept tumbling down on her hair, and she was laughing. We were to have gone away together this morning at dawn. Suddenly I determined to leave her as flower-like as I had found her. I should think the novelty of the emotion must have given you a thrill of real pleasure, Dorian, interrupted Lord Henry. But I can finish your idol for you. You gave her good advice and broke her heart. That was the beginning of your reformation. Harry, you are horrible. We mustn't say these dreadful things. Hetty's heart is not broken. Of course, she cried and all that. But there is no disgrace upon her. She can live, like Perdita, in her garden of mint and marigold. And weep over a faithless Florizel, said Lord Henry, laughing, as he leaned back in his chair. My dear Dorian, you have the most curiously boyish moods do you think this girl will ever be really content now with any one of her own rank i suppose she will be married some day to a rough carter or a grinning ploughman well the fact of having met you and loved you will teach her to despise her husband and she will be wretched from a moral point of view, I cannot say that I think much of your great renunciation. Even as a beginning, it is poor. Besides, how do you know that Hetty isn't floating at the present moment in some starlit mill-pond with lovely water lilies round her, like Ophelia? I can't bear this, Harry. You mock at everything, and then suggest the most serious tragedies. I'm sorry, I told you now. I don't care what you say to me. I know I was right in acting as I did. Poor Hetty! As I rode past the farm this morning, I saw her white face at the window, like a spray of jasmine. Don't let us talk about it any more, and don't try to persuade me that the first good action I have done for years, the first little bit of self-sacrifice I have ever known, is really a sort of sin. I want to be better. I am going to be better. Tell me something about yourself. What is going on in town? 
I have not been to the club for days. The people are still discussing poor Basil's disappearance. I should have thought they had got tired of that by this time, said Dorian, pouring himself out some wine and frowning slightly. My dear boy, they have only been talking about it for six weeks, and the British public are really not equal to the mental strain of having more than one topic every three months. They have been very fortunate lately, however. They have had my own divorce case, and Alan Campbell's suicide. Now they have got the mysterious disappearance of an artist. Scotland Yard still insists that the man in the grey Ulster who left for Paris by the midnight train on the 9th of November was poor Basil, and the French police declare that Basil never arrived in Paris at all. I suppose in about a fortnight we shall be told that he has been seen in San Francisco. It is an odd thing, but everyone who disappears is said to be seen at San Francisco. It must be a delightful city, and possess all the attractions of the next world. What do you think has happened to Basil? asked Dorian, holding up his burgundy against the light, and wondering how it was that he could discuss the matter so calmly. I have not the slightest idea. If Basil chooses to hide himself, it is no business of mine. If he is dead, I don't want to think about him. Death is the only thing that ever terrifies me. I hate it. Why? said the younger man wearily. Because said Lord Henry, passing beneath his nostrils the gilt trellis of an open vinaigrette box. One can survive everything nowadays, except that. Death and vulgarity are the only two facts in the nineteenth century that one cannot explain away. Let us have our coffee in the music-room, Dorian. You must play Chopin to me. The man with whom my wife ran away played Chopin exquisitely. Poor Victoria. I was very fond of her. The house is rather lonely without her. Of course, married life is merely a habit. A bad habit. But then one regrets the loss even of one's worst habits. Perhaps one regrets them the most. They are such an essential part of one's personality. Dorian said nothing, but rose from the table and passing into the next room sat down to the piano and let his fingers stray across the white and black ivory of the keys after the coffee had been brought in he stopped and looking over at lord henry said harry did it ever occur to you that basil was murdered lord henry yawned oh, basil was very popular and always wore a waterbury watch why should he have been murdered? He was not clever enough to have enemies. Of course he had a wonderful genius for painting, but a man can paint like Velasquez, and yet be as dull as possible. Basil was really rather dull. He only interested me once, and that was when he told me years ago that he had a wild adoration for you, and that you were the dominant motive of his art. I was very fond of Basil said Dorian, with a note of sadness in his voice. But don't people say that he was murdered? Oh, some of the papers do. It does not seem to me to be at all probable. I know there are dreadful places in Paris, but Basil was not the sort of man to have gone to them. He had no curiosity. It was his chief defect. What would you say, Harry, if I told you that I had murdered Basil? said the younger man. He watched him intently after he had spoken. I would say, my dear fellow, that you are posing for a character that doesn't suit you. All crime is vulgar, just as all vulgarity is crime. It is not in you, Dorian, to commit a murder. I am sorry if I hurt your vanity by saying so, but I assure you it is true. Crime belongs exclusively to the lower orders. I don't blame them in the smallest degree. I should fancy that crime was to them what art is to us, simply a method of procuring extraordinary sensations. A method of procuring sensations? Don't you think, then, that a man who has once committed a murder could possibly do the same crime again? Don't tell me that. Oh, anything becomes a pleasure if one does it too often, cried Lord Henry, laughing. That is one of the most important secrets of life. I should fancy, however, that murder is always a mistake. 
one should never do anything that one cannot talk about after dinner. But let us pass from poor Basil. I wish I could believe that he had come to such a really romantic end, as you suggest. But I can't. I dare say he fell into the sen of an omnibus, and that the conductor hushed up the scandal. Yes, I should fancy that was his end. I see him, lying now, on his back, under those dull green waters, with the heavy barges floating over him, and long weeds catching in his hair. Do you know, I don't think he would have done much more good work. During the last ten years his painting had gone off very much. Dorian heaved a sigh and Lord Henry strolled across the room and began to stroke the head of a curious Java parrot, a large grey-plumaged bird with pink crest and tail that was balancing itself upon a bamboo perch. As his pointed fingers touched it, it dropped the white scurf of crinkled lids over black glass-like eyes and began to sway backwards and forwards. Yes he continued, turning round and taking his handkerchief out of his pocket. His painting had quite gone off. It seemed to me to have lost something. It had lost an ideal. When you and he ceased to be great friends, he ceased to be a great artist. What was it separated you? I suppose he bored you. If so, he never forgave you. It's a habit bores have. By the way, what has become of that wonderful portrait he did of you? I don't think I have ever seen it since he finished it. Oh, I remember your telling me years ago that you had sent it down to Selby and that it had got mislaid or stolen on the way. You never got it back? Oh, what a pity. It was really a masterpiece. I remember I wanted to buy it. I wish I had now. It belonged to Basil's best period. Since then his work was that curious mixture of bad painting and good intentions that always entitles a man to be called a representative British artist. Did you advertise for it? You should. I forget, said Dorian. I suppose I did, but I never really liked it. I am sorry I sat for it. The memory of the thing is hateful to me. Why do you talk of it? It used to remind me of those curious lines of some play, Hamlet, I think, how do they run? Like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Yes, that is what it was like. Lord Henry laughed. <laughs> if a man treats life artistically, his brain is his heart. He answered, sinking into an armchair. Dorian Gray shook his head and struck some soft chords on the piano. Like a painting of a sorrow, he repeated, a face without a heart. The elder man lay back and looked at him with half-closed eyes. By the way, Dorian, he said, after a pause, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose, how does the quotation run, his own soul? The music jarred, and Dorian Gray started and stared at his friend. Why do you ask me that, Harry? My dear fellow said Lord Henry, elevating his eyebrows in surprise. I asked you because I thought you might be able to give me an answer. That is all. I was going through the park last Sunday, and close by the marble arch there stood a little crowd of shabby-looking people listening to some vulgar street preacher. As I passed by, I heard the man yelling out that question to his audience. It struck me as being rather dramatic. London is very rich in curious effects of that kind. A wet Sunday, an uncouth Christian in a Mackintosh, a ring of sickly white faces under a broken roof of dripping umbrellas, and a wonderful phrase flung into the air by shrill, hysterical lips. It was really very good in its way, quite a suggestion. I thought of telling the prophet that art had a soul, but that man had not— I'm afraid, however, he would not have understood me. Don't, Harry. The soul is a terrible reality. It can be bought and sold and bartered away. It can be poisoned or made perfect. There is a soul in each one of us. I know it. Do you feel quite sure of that, Dorian? Quite sure. Ah, then it must be an illusion. 
the things one feels absolutely certain about are never true that is the fatality of faith and the lesson of romance how grave you are don't be so serious what have you or i to do with the superstitions of our age no we have given up our belief in the soul play me something play me a nocturne dorian and as you play tell me in a low voice how you have kept your youth you must have some secret i am only ten years older than you are and i am wrinkled and worn and yellow you are really wonderful dorian you have never looked more charming than you do to-night you remind me of the day i saw you first you were rather cheeky very shy and absolutely extraordinary you have changed of course but not in appearance i wish you would tell me your secret to get back my youth i would do anything in the world except take exercise get up early or be respectable youth there is nothing like it it's absurd to talk of the ignorance of youth the only people to whose opinions i listen now with any respect are people much younger than myself they seem in front of me life has revealed to them her latest wonder as for the aged i always contradict the aged i do it on principle if you ask them their opinion on something that happened yesterday they solemnly give you the opinions current in eighteen twenty when people wore high stocks believed in everything and knew absolutely nothing how lovely that thing you are playing is i wonder did chopin write it at majorca with the sea weeping round the villa and the salt spray dashing against the panes it is marvellously romantic what a blessing it is that there is one art left to us that is not imitative don't stop i want music to-night it seems to me that you are the young apollo and that i am marcius listening to you i have sorrows dorian of my own that even you know nothing of the tragedy of old age is not that one is old but that one is young I am amazed sometimes at my own sincerity. Ah, Dorian, how happy you are! What an exquisite life you have had! You have drunk deeply of everything. You have crushed the grapes against your palate. Nothing has been hidden from you, and it has all been to you no more than the sound of music. It has not marred you. You are still the same. I am not the same, Haddy yes you are the same i wonder what the rest of your life will be don't spoil it by renunciations at present you are a perfect type don't make yourself incomplete you are quite flawless now you need not shake your head you know you are besides dorian don't deceive yourself life is not governed by will or intention life is a question of nerves and fibres and slowly built-up cells in which thought hides itself and passion has its dreams you may fancy yourself safe and think yourself strong but a chance tone of colour in a room or a morning sky a particular perfume that you had once loved and that brings subtle memories with it a line from a forgotten poem that you had come across again a cadence from a piece of music that you had ceased to play i tell you dorian that it is on things like these that our lives depend browning writes about that somewhere but our own senses will imagine them for us there are moments when the odour of lila blanc passes suddenly across me and i have to live the strangest month of my life over again i wish i could change places with you dorian the world has cried out against us both but it has always worshipped you it always will worship you you are the type of what the age is searching for and what it is afraid it has found i am so glad that you have never done anything never carved a statue or painted a picture or produced anything outside of yourself life has been your art you have set yourself to music your days are your sonnets 
dorian rose up from the piano and passed his hand through his hair yes life has been exquisite he murmured but i am not going to have the same life harry and you must not say these extravagant things to me you don't know everything about me i think that if you did even you would turn from me you laugh don't laugh why have you stopped playing dorian go back and give me the nocturne over again look at that great honey-coloured moon that hangs in the dusky air she is waiting for you to charm her and if you play she will come closer to the earth you won't let us go to the club then it has been a charming evening and we must end it charmingly there is some one at white's who wants immensely to know you young lord poole burnamouth's eldest son he has already copied your neckties and has begged me to introduce him to you he is quite delightful and rather reminds me of you i hope not said dorian with a sad look in his eyes but i am tired to-night harry i shan't go to the club it is nearly eleven and i want to go to bed early do stay you have never played so well as to-night there was something in your touch that was wonderful it had more expression than i had ever heard from it before it is because i am going to be good he answered smiling i am a little changed already you cannot change to me dorian said lord henry you and i will always be friends yet you poisoned me with a book once i should not forgive that harry promise me that you will never lend that book to any one it does harm my dear boy you are really beginning to moralize you will soon be going about like the converted and the revivalist warning people against all the sins of which you have grown tired you are much too delightful to do that besides it is no use you and i are what we are and will be what we will be as for being poisoned by a book there is no such thing as that art has no influence upon action it annihilates the desire to act it is superbly sterile the books that the world calls immoral are books that show the world its own shame that is all oh but we won't discuss literature come round to-morrow i am going to ride at eleven we might go together and i will take you to lunch afterwards with lady Branksome. She is a charming woman, and wants to consult you about some tapestries she is thinking of buying. Mind you come. Or shall we lunch with our little duchess? She says she never sees you now. Perhaps you're tired of Gladys? I thought you would be. A clever tongue gets on one's nerves. Well, in any case, be here at eleven. Must I really come, Harry? Certainly. The park is quite lovely now. I don't think there have been such lilacs since the year I met you. Very well. I shall be here at eleven, said Dorian. Good night, Harry. As he reached the door, he hesitated for a moment, as if he had something more to say. Then he sighed and went out. End of chapter 19 The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter Twenty. It was a lovely night, so warm that he threw his coat over his arm, and did not even put his silk scarf round his throat. As he strolled home, smoking his cigarette, two young men in evening dress passed him. He heard one of them whisper to the other, That is Dorian Gray. He remembered how pleased he used to be when he was pointed out, or stared at, or talked about. He was tired of hearing his own name now. Half the charm of the little village where he had been so often lately was that no one knew who he was. He had often told the girl whom he had lured to love him that he was poor, and she had believed him. He had told her once that he was wicked and she had laughed at him and answered that wicked people were always very old and very ugly what a laugh she had just like a thrush singing and how pretty she had been in her cotton dresses and her large hats she knew nothing 
but she had everything that he had lost. When he reached home, he found his servant waiting up for him. He sent him to bed, and threw himself down on the sofa in the library, and began to think over some of the things that Lord Henry had said to him. Was it really true that one could never change? He felt a wild longing for the unstained purity of his boyhood, his rose-white boyhood, as Lord Henry had once called it. He knew that he had tarnished himself, filled his mind with corruption, and given horror to his fancy, that he had been an evil influence to others, and had experienced a terrible joy in being so and that of the lives that had crossed his own, it had been the fairest and the most full of promise that he had brought to shame. But was it all irretrievable? Was there no hope for him? Ah, oh, in what a monstrous moment of pride and passion he had prayed that the portrait should bear the burden of his days, and he keep the unsullied splendour of eternal youth. All his failure had been due to that. Better for him that each sin of his life had brought its sure, swift penalty along with it. There was purification in punishment. Not forgive us our sins, but smite us for our iniquities should be the prayer of man to a most just God. The curiously carved mirror that Lord Henry had given to him, so many years ago now, was standing on the table, and the white-limbed cupids laughed round it as of old. He took it up, as he had done on that night of horror, when he had first noted the change in the fatal picture and with wild, tear-dimmed eyes looked into its polished shield. Once someone who had terribly loved him had written to him a mad letter, ending with these idolatrous words. The world is changed because you are made of ivory and gold. The curves of your lips rewrite history. The phrases came back to his memory and he repeated them over and over to himself. Then he loathed his own beauty, and flinging the mirror on the floor, crushed it into silver splinters beneath his heel. It was his beauty that had ruined him, his beauty and the youth that he had prayed for. But for those two things his life might have been free from stain. His beauty had been to him but a mask, his youth but a mockery. What was youth at best? A green, an unripe time, a time of shallow moods and sickly thoughts. Why had he worn its livery? Youth had spoiled him. It was better not to think of the past. Nothing could alter that. It was of himself and of his own future that he had to think. James Vane was hidden in a nameless grave in Selby Churchyard. Alan Campbell had shot himself one night in his laboratory, but had not revealed the secret that he had been forced to know. The excitement such as it was over Basil Hallward's disappearance would soon pass away. It was already waning. He was perfectly safe there. Nor indeed was it the death of Basil Hallward that weighed most upon his mind. It was the living death of his own soul that troubled him. Basil had painted the portrait that had marred his life. He could not forgive him that. It was the portrait that had done everything. Basil had said things to him that were unbearable, and that he had yet born with patience. The murder had been simply the madness of a moment. As for Alan Campbell, his suicide had been his own act. He had chosen to do it. It was nothing to him. 
a new life that was what he wanted that was what he was waiting for surely he had begun it already he had spared one innocent thing at any rate he would never again tempt innocence he would be good as he thought of hetty merton he began to wonder if the portrait in the locked room had changed surely it was not still so horrible as it had been perhaps if his life became pure he would be able to expel every sign of evil passion from the face perhaps the signs of evil had already gone away he would go and look he took the lamp from the table and crept upstairs as he unbarred the door a smile of joy flitted across his strangely young-looking face and lingered for a moment about his lips yes he would be good and the hideous thing that he had hidden away would no longer be a terror to him he felt as if the load had been lifted from him already he went in quietly locking the door behind him as was his custom and dragged the purple hanging from the portrait a cry of pain and indignation broke from him he could see no change save that in the eyes there was a look of cunning and in the mouth the curved wrinkle of the hypocrite the thing was still loathsome more loathsome if possible than before and the scarlet dew that spotted the hand seemed brighter and more like blood newly spilled then he trembled had it been merely vanity that had made him do his one good deed or the desire for a new sensation as lord henry had hinted with his mocking laugh or that passion to act a part that sometimes makes us do things finer than we are ourselves or perhaps all these and why was the red stain larger than it had been it seemed to have crept like a horrible disease over the wrinkled fingers there was blood on the painted feet as though the thing had dripped blood even on the hand that had not held the knife confess did it mean that he was to confess to give himself up and be put to death he laughed he felt that the idea was monstrous besides even if he did confess who would believe him there was no trace of the murdered man anywhere everything belonging to him had been destroyed he himself had burned what had been below stairs the world would simply say that he was mad they would shut him up if he persisted in his story yet it was his duty to confess to suffer public shame and to make public atonement there was a god who called upon men to tell their sins to earth as well as to heaven nothing that he could do would cleanse him till he had told his own sin his sin he shrugged his shoulders the death of basil hallward seemed very little to him he was thinking of hetty merton for it was an unjust mirror this mirror of his soul that he was looking at vanity curiosity hypocrisy had there been nothing more in his renunciation than that there had been something more at least he thought so but who could tell no there had been nothing more through vanity he had spared her in hypocrisy he had worn the mask of goodness for curiosity's sake he had tried the denial of self he recognized that now but this murder was it to dog him all his life was he always to be burdened by his past was he really to confess never there was only one bit of evidence left against him the picture itself 
that was evidence he would destroy it why had he kept it so long once it had given him pleasure to watch it changing and growing old of late he had felt no such pleasure it had kept him awake at night when he had been away he had been filled with terror lest other eyes should look upon it it had brought melancholy across his passions its mere memory had marred many moments of joy it had been like conscience to him yes it had been conscience he would destroy it he looked round and saw the knife that had stabbed basil hallward he had cleaned it many times till there was no stain left upon it it was bright and glistened as it had killed the painter so it would kill the painter's work and all that that meant it would kill the past and when that was dead he would be free it would kill this monstrous soul life and without its hideous warnings he would be at peace he seized the thing and stabbed the picture with it there was a cry heard and a crash the cry was so horrible in its agony that the frightened servants woke and crept out of their rooms two gentlemen who were passing in the square below stopped and looked up at the great house they walked on till they met a policeman and brought him back the man rang the bell several times but there was no answer except for a light in one of the top windows the house was all dark after a time he went away and stood in an adjoining portico and watched whose house is that constable asked the elder of the two gentlemen mr dorian gray sir answered the policeman they looked at each other as they walked away and sneered one of them was sir henry ashton's uncle inside in the servants part of the house the half-clad domestics were talking in low whispers to each other old mrs leaf was crying and wringing her hands francis was as pale as death after about a quarter of an hour he got the coachman and one of the footmen and crept upstairs they knocked but there was no reply they called out everything was still finally after vainly trying to force the door they got on the roof and dropped down onto the balcony the windows yielded easily their bolts were old when they entered they found hanging upon the wall a splendid portrait of their master as they had last seen him in all the wonder of his exquisite youth and beauty lying on the floor was a dead man in evening dress with a knife in his heart he was withered wrinkled and loathsome of visage it was not till they had examined the rings that they recognized who it was End of chapter 20 End of the Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde